All right. Well, today I wanted to share about the Four Noble Truths. So this is one of the core teachings of Buddhism, of the Buddha. And um, I can go on a long time about the Four Noble Truths. But I want to give you a, a, a give it to you in a nutshell, because it's, it's really it, any teaching of Buddhism that you want to understand, if you don't know the Four Noble Truths, it's not going to make very much sense. Because this is kind of the heart of, of the Buddhist teachings. So in a nutshell, I'll give you four words that correspond to the Four Noble, Shu, four noble Truths. And this is, this is really what we're practicing. This is what we're doing. So the four words are let go and be happy. Let go, be happy. Those are the four. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> that's basically, the, that's, the, that's what we're doing in a nutshell. And I can probably end there. <laughs> the rest is just, you know, our own kind of what, we'll fi we're figuring out more details, like what does that actually mean? But that's kind of the overview of it. So just to break that down, let go means um, in this moment, in this present moment, whatever it is that we are trying to be or become, let go of that. <laughs> that should make us pretty happy right there. If you do that, then happiness follows immediately afterwards, right? Because <laughs> we don't have to try to be something other than what we are right now. That's it. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> We're pretty much done. Um, I could, I'll share, just so you know, the, the Four Noble Truths are, first of all, these are, why they're called Noble Truths is that um, they can be applied in any moment of our existence. They can be applied anywhere, anytime. So, I mean, we can do this in a meditation retreat when we're practicing meditation. And so we're, we're putting the practice of the Four Noble Truths uh, into practice while we're meditating. That's one, this is only one place though that we can practice. We can practice anywhere. So these are, these are truths that can be applied to any, any moment of our life. Whether we are um, in a sacred setting, so-called sacred setting, like the Pure Land or a church or a synagogue or uh, an amazing natural formation, or whether we're sitting on the toilet, taking a dump. Any place that we happen to be, uh, from the most sacred to the most mundane, this, these can be practiced. Uh, they were put forth by the Buddha, which is a, a title for, means just an, an awakened being. Um, and it goes back to an actual historical person. So uh, his name, uh, his, his name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he lived about 2,500 years ago. And he was born a very wealthy, uh, in, into a very into huge amounts of wealth, and into huge amounts of power. And so I think it's pretty significant that the kind of the Buddha is considered the founder of this teaching that only became known as Buddhism a couple hundred years ago when Western scholars started to study outside of the European uh, nations. Only then that we have this term called Buddhism, but there's just this person named Siddhartha, the Buddha, lived about 80 years born very wealthy with lots of power. It's like, you know, he, he had so much, he was the Donald Trump of the 2,500 years ago, you know. And what's significant about his teaching, and it is, it's not the teaching, it's actually what's not, what's not significant 
the teaching is significant, but it's not as significant as something else. And that is his, his example that he let go of his wealth. That's significant. That's huge. I want to see our president let go of his wealth. <laughs> and he let go of his power too. I want to see our president do that too. I mean, it's a lot, it's a big, it's a, it's something huge, but you know, forget about our own president. We just look at ourselves. you know, we look at our own, our, at our own life and how much we grasp after power. You know, if we're really honest with ourselves, we want power and we want, we want a certain degree of wealth. We want a certain degree of comfort. And, um, and Buddha had, all, Siddhartha had all of these things. He had the, he had all of the comforts of a, of a prince because that's what he was. He was a prince. And, uh, and he had the ability to, to re relinquish that. He, he realized that that was not going to bring him to happiness. So uh, he, he actually mortified his body for six years, thinking that that would then. You know, okay, so if I don't go this way, if, I, if, if having power and wealth isn't the answer, then well, maybe if I do the opposite, go towards mortifying my body, denying, of it, denying it of all sensual pleasures, uh, give up all of my attachments, then, then I'll get it. And he realized that's not the way either. That's, the, that's the, just the other extreme. Uh, so what he proposed is a middle way a middle path between those two extremes. Once he realized, okay, it's not this extreme, not that extreme, then he was on the path of enlightenment. That's, that's the story. And then he began to, once he began to live, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to do this or, or I'm gonna do that. But then he started actually living in that way and breathing in that way and, and practicing in that way and, and uh, taking food and taking enough to, 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 to uh, live a happy life. Once he started doing that and embodying that, not just wanting to do it, but embodying it, then he started to change. His, his being started to change and he became a teacher of several thousand people. And basically, he set forth this eightfold path. So eight things that we need to consider um, when, you know, in life. It doesn't matter whether you're Buddhist or not Buddhist. It's eight things to consider. And you may have heard some of these eight elsewhere than, than right here. But I think the, the Buddha tries to put it all together for us in the eight simple steps. Uh, and those steps, the first one is right view. Right view means to know the Four Noble Truths as reality, that the first one is that there is suffering. You know? So nobody can fool us and tell us, oh, you can, you can escape suffering if you just do this, you know? <laughs> right, that's the, that's the big thing in what we were talking about earlier with advertising. Advertising loves to kind of get us to see our it hooks us because it knows that we're suffering in some way. And so the Buddha just says it straight out. Life is suffering. There's no way to escape it. No way to escape that. And this is a, you know, this is a noble truth because if we really are to take that in and accept it, I, I don't know about you, but I find, I find a huge weight lifted off of my shoulders when I can accept that that noble truth. Life is suffering. And uh, it's suffering in the terms of birth. You know, I don't know anybody who's been born into this world who didn't come in crying. You know, it starts right there. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to cry. You know, we need to you know, just kind of own that. Birth is suffering. Old age, as we get older, our body breaks down, doesn't work the way it used to, that's suffering. Or maybe it never worked the way it, we wanted it to. And then we get sick. 
I get sick at times. I just got over a cold, feeling better. I'm happy. <laughs> but there's no way to escape getting sick. And then, of course, there's death. And that's, uh, you know, sometimes we're in the throes of dealing with death of a loved one, or maybe it's our own, um, it's our own death. But so, and sometimes we're not, our, our mind is not there at all. And it seems like far, far away. And that's okay. But these are the four things that, that, that um, characterize our life. And uh, so Buddha just laying it out for us. Then the, the second noble truth is that um, suffering, is, there's a cause. Actually, that's the third noble truth. The, the second noble truth is that there is a cause to suffering. Now, all of these truths, they all kind of come together at one point. And so we're just kind of teasing them out here. But if you, know, if you can recognize there's suffering, then immediately you want to know the response to it, the answer to it. And an advertiser will tell you, just take this or just do that. Uh, and the Buddha is a great advertiser. You know, he'll say, here, I got something for you too. Uh, and it doesn't cost anything. You just apply your mind in the way that he's suggesting. Actually, I shouldn't say it doesn't cost anything. It does cost something. Um, you know, what you put into it is what you'll get out of it. So the, the, the amount of energy, I don't mean just money, the amount of time and energy you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. Uh, so uh, there's 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 suffering, and then there's a cause to suffering. And if there's a cause, there has to be a um, a way to end it. If there's a cause to it, then there has to be an ending to it. That's the third noble truth. And then the, the Buddha lays out this eightfold path that leads to liberation from suffering. So we don't want to just stay in suffering. You know, suffering is not something we're going to just like wallow in. That's not the program. Because that's a, you know, what I mentioned earlier. Let go and be happy. Four words. Let go, be happy. And so when we can really let go, that's the, that's the, the cause of suffering is craving. Craving for what we don't have. And want grasping after what we don't have. And, um, and so to let go of that craving, immediately, there should be some kind of relief when we actually earnestly let go. And craving, um, we crave basically for three things. There's three things we crave. We crave for we crave for being, and one way to think about being is we crave for everlasting life, life never to end, to always be here. You know, especially when we got it really good, we want the moment to last forever. Well, that's one form of craving, and the the uh, what I would think of as the the byproduct of that kind of craving that we see is anxiety. The other, uh, the other thing we crave for is non-being. We want our life to end. We want to end it all because we're in so much pain. That's another craving. That's something we crave for. So being, non-being. And that, the byproduct of that is depression. So those two, two extremes, anxiety, depression. And then the third one is uh, sensual pleasure. So remember, he's not saying that we shouldn't have, we should totally deny ourselves, because that's an, that's an extreme. But to, uh, to focus on attaining sensual pleasure is, a, is also a kind of craving. And so anyway, when, you, when you're sitting, you can ask yourself if you're, if you're not happy. Okay, that's it. If you're not happy, which one of those three things am I grasping after right now? Because it keeps it really simple. I mean, there might be, it, you, you might have a storyline behind those three, but um, those are, that's kind of the foundation of it, those three things. Am I craving to 
be here forever, never die? Am I craving for death or am I craving for sensual pleasure? And if you, can, if you can name your craving, then you can begin to release your grip on it. It might be all three at different, you know, one moment it's one, next moment it's that. You know, it might not be one of those things. It might be all three at once or at different mind moments. But um, when you recognize it, just to let go. And if, and, if, and if, you know, you don't know which one it is, just having that attitude of letting go, releasing, and finding some degree of okayness with this moment. That's, where, that's what we're at. Now, the, the great thing about these Four Noble Truths is that they can be practiced as individuals like we're doing right now. They can be practiced, though, also as a community. Like a, I like to think a, of whole organizations like businesses. Businesses also practice these uh, on some form, or, or they don't practice them. Uh, a business can, gra can grasp at being, non-being, or sensual pleasure, too. So it's not just on the personal level that these can be applied. It can also be applied on larger level, on the community level, uh, on the political level. You know? And to the degree that we can practice these things with some success, be aware of these Four Noble Truths, put them in the practice, we, we, um, depending on which level we're working at, if we're working on the individual level, we're lessening our own suffering, but if we're working on a more of a collective level, as a part of an organization, we have a great power there to reduce, reduce suffering there too. So I think that's what I want to, that's, that's, you know, that's enough. We can practice that now. We can use our, our meditation to, to, to now look at how our mind, it's not that we don't, it's not that we either grasp or don't grasp, and it's not that you're a bad person if you're grasping or not. It's developing awareness. Oh, this is what I'm, my mind is doing right now. This is, I'm grasping after one of those three in some form. But you test it out. I'm not telling you that this is what you have to do. This is just, you know, some ancient advice from, from the Buddha and some encouragement to, to look at that and see for yourself. Because it's not, it's not whether you're, you don't have to prove it to anybody. It's more checking it out for yourself and seeing. What if I, did, you, know, you know, you can ask yourself the question, what if I checked out my own cravings? And what if just for this moment I, I let them go? and see how that feels in your own body and mind. See if it makes any difference or any changes. Um, I wanna close with, with uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, section. This is, these are the words of the Buddha spoken about 2,500 years ago. And he talks about dealing with fear and dread. So I think, I think when we sit, you know, when, whenever we approach fear and dread, you know, what do we do? Or another way to think of this is anxiety. So we all, we all suffer with, with anxiety at some time. What did the Buddha do when he dealt with his... He, see, he was a human being. He wasn't a god. The Buddha was not trying to become a god. And he, was not a, he wasn't even a guru. He wasn't somebody to be followed. He was just giving an example of how to be and sharing that with others. So, so what did he do? When uh, anxiety approached, he says, while I walked, the fear, and, uh, the fear and dread came upon me. So if he was experiencing anxiety while he was walking, I neither stood nor sat nor lay down till I had subdued that fear and dread. While I stood, the, if the fear and dread came upon me, I neither walked nor sat nor lay down till I had subdued that fear and dread. While I sat, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor lay down till I had subdued that fear and dread. While I lay down, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor sat down till I had subdued that fear and dread. So there's four postures that we have. We have a choice to sit, to, to, sit, to walk, to stand, or to lie down. Any one of those four postures we can use today. And 
if you're finding yourself anxious, you can, you know, look at you. It's an opportunity to look at that. And the Buddha says, you know, instead of trying to shift and move and, and try to run away from that, just watch it and see what happens. Our usual tendency is to want to get up, to leave, to do something else, to distract ourselves. And the Buddha says, just, you know, watch it, look at it until it's subdued. And uh, sometimes that takes effort. Sometimes it's the releasing of effort. But I would suggest, you know, looking at those, just keep it simple, looking at those three cravings that we have and see if we can release that and see if that helps any. And if you have any degree of success, even just a little bit, a little bit of change, then maybe consider changing to a different posture at that time. And so this way we, we maintain awareness of whatever's going on in our body mind. Mm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.